um, which brings us to the last talk of the afternoon. And this is another service available uh, that you might have been at the receiving end of it, uh, which is the invited review mechanism by the College of Surgeons. And we, we, uh, Ralph Tom, Tomlinson, who's been with the service for a while, is going to explain to us how it works and uh, what are the normal outcomes from these kind of reviews. Thank you very much, Ralph. Thank you very much indeed, and um, it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, to have the slot on the agenda. Um, appreciate you probably all had quite a long afternoon, um, but hopefully I can give you some interesting information and an interesting talk to conclude things. And I'm very happy to be heckled or interrupted or uh, get any questions or comments as I go along or at the end. So please do chip in if there's anything you want to clarify as I talk. Um, title of the talk was given uh, previously uh, to a previous one of these sessions, but essentially um, I really want to kick off by saying that uh, my reflection from seeing one of these BBC programmes, I've forgotten the title of it, something like uh, Your Life in Their Hands or something like that, um, or At the Edge of Life, seeing colleagues uh, within SCTS at Patworth uh, operating on patients recently, having just uh, stopped a different programme and flicked over. Uh, just, you know, I've never, never uh, failed to be amazed at the just incredible job that um, you'll get to do day to day. I sit in this now, uh, my front bedroom, um, pushing paper around a desk and you're all in operating theatres doing amazing things to people or with people um, with their content hopefully as well. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you have a brilliant and amazing jobs and hopefully as this presentation will show, um, it's not as difficult as you might think to stay on track and to keep things in a good place. Um, and it's predominantly down to how you interact with other human beings in your day-to-day -day work, um, the sort of person you are and the kind of behaviors you display. It's very, very rare in my experience that you'll really get into trouble uh, from a clinical perspective, given all the uh, fantastic training that you've had. It's not impossible, it does happen, um, but it's, it's rare what gets people and teams in particular into real difficulties is, is how they come together as a group, how they interrelate and how they behave towards one another. So if there's anything you take away from the next uh, 20 minutes, um, it'll be that. And um, if you can reflect on your own behaviors, how you might come across day to day, are you the sort of person you'd want to have a drink with in the pub? Um, if you drink, if you don't drink, um, would you like to just uh, you know, spend the evening chatting to that person? Um, if you try and bear that in mind and think through that kind of a test, then I think hopefully you'll um, stay out of some of the difficulties that I'll describe. Um, now I'm going to hesitate as I try and change slides. Um, I'm not quite sure why my slides have frozen. Are they, are they changing on anyone else's screen? Not yet, no. No, not really. Um, give me two seconds. No. That's bizarre. Hmm. That's completely frozen at this end, unfortunately. I'll try a different tactic. Hold on. Any better? Yeah, that's changed. Yeah, that's yeah, great. So quick overview of invited reviews. Um, clues in the title, they're invited by a hospital. Um, they're a partnership between the college, in this case, the SCTS of the association. Um, they've got a very clear and narrow remit, which is that they're there to identify if a cause of concern exists or not. We're not trying to do what um, performance um, advice service that you just heard about are trying to do and sort of understand the underlying uh, sort of factors that are affecting performance through their assessment processes. We're just trying to identify is there a cause of concern here or not. If there is one, what needs to be done to improve it. Uh, they're confidential, independent, impartial, and peer-led and expert. Uh, we think it's really important that surgeons take responsibility um, working with lay people representing the patient and public interest for sorting out problems within their own profession and their own specialty because if you don't then you leave it to the lowest common denominator of regulation um, and we don't really think anyone benefits from just relying on regulation we think that surgeons and uh, lay people can provide a leadership role to the whole of uh, surgery and healthcare by undertaking this type of work. Um, as I say, it's confidential, makes recommendations. Um, there is a duty to protect patient safety. So if there are circumstances where we think we've made recommendations and they haven't been addressed in a timely way, then we've got a duty to go to the regulators I mentioned, but um, I'm pleased to say that happens very, very rarely because people often want to work with our recommendations to try and improve situations. Um, and we think it's a kind of active demonstration of the college's commitment to the higher standards of surgical practice and care. So that's a bit of an overview. Again, in terms of logistics and dynamics of it, how 
much and how long. Um, so two surgeons normally, one lay reviewer representing the patient and public interest, uh, one invited review manager managing the process. Normally would go for a couple of days to a hospital, could be three days, could be 20 to 30 interviewees, uh, 50 to 60 different information sources. All of this is happening currently remotely um, because obviously we can't visit, but we're finding that Microsoft Teams is helping us greatly with that. Um, so we're still able to provide what we think is a good service. Um, Timescales can vary from case to case. Uh, normally it takes about 12 weeks to get a visit organized from being requested. And that's normally around the clinical notice periods of the uh, surgeons that we work with because we want them to be an active clinical practice. And then generally we try and get a report out in eight to 10 weeks. I'm not sure if I made it clear at the start when the slides were playing up, but we offer either individual reviews. So looking at uh, individual surgeons practice service reviews, so looking at team practice or clinical record reviews, so giving an independent view on um, a set, set of episodes of care and uh, an expert perspective on those. So those are some logistics. Uh, what have we looked at in terms of what I'm going to talk about today? Well, we are really passionate about not just learning about the same causes of problems each time when we do reviews and not doing anything with that information. So we've looked at a sample of 100 invited reviews, probably since the service started in 1999. I've been involved in it since 2011. Uh, we've probably done in excess of 400 reviews now. Um, and we've looked at a sample size of um, 100 of those. Uh, the 240 mentioned there relates to a different time period, but yeah, total 400, 240 in, in the kind of period from 208 to 217. Uh, chose 100 of them, 58 service reviews, 25 individual and 17 clinical record reviews. And we try to identify themes arising from those invited reviews and then present them in an interesting informative format so that people could learn about what causes problems. We identified about 18 commonly recurring themes that we grouped into five different areas. And we'll send around a, a web link, but essentially we've designed a self um, analysis questionnaire where you can answer 18 yes or no questions about your service and understand whether or not you think there might be some issues that you can uh, address within that service and try and do something proactively about before they become problems that cause difficulties for patient care because we're passionate about saying to people that we need to improve the quality of conversation about surgical performance and get people talking earlier about these things. Um, all too often people don't address things soon enough and um, only address them when they become problems. So if people are having conversations about performance when things are going well, they'll develop the vocabulary of talking about the ups and downs of everyday life. And then when things start diverging, they'll have those conversations much sooner and uh, have a much better quality of discussion um, and not just revert to uh, sensationist language and, and real confrontational uh, debate. So as I say, uh, that 100 uh, sample gives you a bit of information in terms of the split across specialty. You'll see cardiothoracic in that is well represented. We think that's a real strength because I think it's representative of people actually trying to understand issues. Um, so I wouldn't see um, there being a disproportionate number of cardiothoracic cases based on number of uh, people in the uh, specialty as being an issue there. I think it's actually more reflective of, of trying to get on top of issues. Um, so I'd be more concerned where people are underrepresented in that slide than overrepresented. Um, what have we learnt? In over 75% of our reviews, there was a need for improvement in some aspects of the way the surgical care was being delivered. That's fairly self-evident. We're looking at um, whether clinical care is safe. So we identify issues around aspects of that clinical care. And because it's quite a small comparative sample size, we can't really be definitive about whether, I don't know if, if there's a problem with how someone was doing their aortic valve replacement, whether that was translatable to all cardiothoracic surgeons or not, or just that individual case. So we, we kind of didn't really do much uh, kind of sub-analysis of that. But what we did look at was that uh, team working between surgeons was so um, largely represented in that sample of cases. Um, and it's really pertinent to us that that's, that's one of the major areas that there were causes concern in our sample. In over half of the sample, uh, something that could be improved in terms of how concerns were identified and resolved, um, MDT working, uh, individual behaviours, so alongside team behaviours, individual behaviours being quite critical, leadership and management, uh, the kind of concept of a, of a reluctant clinical director just taking their turn rather than someone who's feeling empowered and passionate about fulfilling that really important leadership role. Um, problems with some form of outcome data and some issues with facilities and resources.
And then over a quarter of the reviews, I won't go through the whole list, I'll just pick out a couple of my favourites. I think probably if I invested in one area uh, that I'd improve, it'd be the amount of time and um, energy given to morbidity and mortality meetings. I think that's always something where people really lose an opportunity to get on top of issues as they arise. If practices diverging outcomes are becoming problematic, um, if you're reviewing M and M processes on a sort of every other month basis or something like that, you'll pick them up straight away. Whereas if you're just doing that twice a year and you're having a big argument in a lecture theatre when we could all meet in lecture theatres, um, then that's not going to be as productive. Um, the other thing I'd highlight is activity data. I think it's astonishing to me how many times we can go to a hospital service, not just in cardiothoracic care, but across any specialty and come away and not really know how many operations that team has done in a particular year. Um, and in this day and age with the technology that supports our practice, I just think that's mind blowing sometimes. Those are yeah, other areas less important in our sample, but very, very significant um, in terms of some of the impacts they can have, and particularly around that last one, patient uh, consent and um, candor, I think, being a really, really pertinent and important area that um, not hugely represented, but if it gets problematic, then can have a catastrophic impact on patients' lives and people's careers. Uh, why is any of this important? Why should you bother listening to me? Um, I think, I mean, everyone's got their stories to tell in surgery. I personally think that there aren't as many problems in surgery as people might think. I think a lot of people talk about the same problems a lot of times to the same group of people. Um, and then people get very upset because of that and they feel that the world is falling in. Um, however, having said that, um, when things go wrong in surgery, and you'll all know in cardiothoracic surgery, this can be particularly the case, it can become very public and very, very demanding very, very quickly. Um, so these are just examples. I'm not saying them, I'm showing them for any particular reason of cases we've been involved in where they've received media attention um, and it's just difficult for everybody. It's um, difficult for the staff involved, obviously hideous for any patients that have been affected. Um, nobody comes out of it well. We don't um, do anything in terms of media coverage other than confirm our involvement. We ask the trust to be as open and transparent about what's going on as possible. Um, but when things are played out in the public eye, it can be very, very demanding for all involved. Um, and again, I'd advocate uh, better quality earlier conversations about these things can prevent uh, this type of situation occurring. Or if it does occur, then being as open and transparent about what is happening and sharing information. Um, I think the trust that get on the front foot and do that are the ones that come out of it much better than those that don't because people will recognize surgeons as human beings things can be difficult you are doing an amazing job it can get difficult um, but i think it's where people cover things up or don't be open about it that they get into into difficulties just some other examples here put this one in slightly <sighs> provocatively um but i just the, the, the quote alongside i'll give people a couple of seconds to read it um but that was actually a report in the newspaper in 2013 around um some problems at a particular hospital it can happen and it can be really really demanding for people and it is best that you don't get into that situation and um yeah i'd, I'd advocate as much as possible just trying to think through ways to avoid that and i'll talk about some uh, ways you can in a minute this being one of them, I uh, was uh, first election I voted in was the 97 uh, New Labour landslide victory. All about education, education, education. For me, it's team working and behaviours, team working and behaviours, and team working and behaviours. Uh, I said quite a bit about it already, but uh, just to overemphasise that point. Uh, and what is a team? What is your team as a consultant? Is it a team in your theatre? Is it your consultant surgical team? How do you create your identity? How do you assure your quality interaction as a group? Do you just sit all down a corridor and never speak to each other behind closed doors? Or do you come together regularly and have conversations? How do you manage sub-teams, subspecialty interests? How do you deal with that as it relates to private practice? How do you make sure you talk about that rather than just put it under the table? Um, how would you come together when you're on call? Doing a shared task, you might not do the procedures as regularly. Um, you might not have as much confidence in your colleagues as you might do in yourself in a particular area. Um, do you think about how your teams are created and, and how they work together? And do you meet? That's just such an important one that people forget. So easy just to defer the meeting, say, oh no, we've all had a long day, let's not meet. But just make sure you have regular meetings is so important, so important as a group. Uh, individual behaviours, uh, I guess there's 
hopefully quite a big shift away from the heroic consultant model. Um, he says, having eulogized about the uh, BBC documentary at the start. So uh, maybe you can see the irony in that. Anyway, um, yeah, hopefully across the board, there's a bit of a shift in terms of not seeing uh, the surgeon as a kind of single hero and person solving everything. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, understanding it is, is a unique role. Um, but I think how people recognize the need to be part of a team, that they are sometimes going to be followers as well as leaders of a team, how they appreciate and understand other people's skills and what they bring. Thinking about your relationships with non-consultant team members, um, not talking about juniors, but talking about trainees, thinking about your wider team members. Um, don't get stuck in a rut of negative attitudes to non-clinical managers. Uh, they just do a different job to you. They're trying their best too. And don't get into a massive uh, us and them relationship with senior management. It's so easy just to get into those labels. I appreciate all of the bureaucracy of the health service is really frustrating when you just want to operate. But just don't get yourself locked into those kind of dynamics because it just no one comes out of them well. Um, individual behaviours. Insight. I think if you could uh, create and bottle insight and sell it, um, you would be a very rich person. Um, developing self-awareness. Uh, developing a willingness to accept and understand criticism without um, having confidence not by it um, and developing that kind of robustness that you are able you, know, you don't necessarily have to accept what someone says about you but it's important to acknowledge it and to understand it and try and see it from their point of view and can you be dispassionate about a set of circumstances and recognize another's perspective it's really really important as you develop into your consultant careers and continue through them um, People dismissing concerns when people challenge competence um, and then immediately go against the kind of motivations of the person raising those concerns rather than having a look at the concerns themselves. Thinking about feedback, as I've said, um, and just demonstrating the kind of highly variable behaviours. Um, again, behaviours that might have been accepted 20 years ago just aren't acceptable now. And actually, people don't need you to be this kind of maverick figure that, uh, you know, well, it's all great because they've got great hands and don't they do brilliant operations. Well, yeah, we want you to do brilliant operations, but we also want you to be a sensible person and not the person people fear in theatre. Um, just really important to think about that. Um, so a bit of theory. I don't know how much time I've got, so I won't go through all of these, but um, good model to describe dysfunctional team working and then reverse it. And you can try and create good team working. Um, I won't go through it in detail, but I will suggest you have a look at our high performing surgical team good practice guide because it covers it in a lot of detail. Um, I love this model. People might have heard it before, but strengths and weaknesses. Um, so your strengths overplayed become your weakness. Um, people always see kind of people people in life and surgeons in general as either being good or bad or you know, well behaved or poorly behaved actually everyone's just only a step away from from their their real strength becoming a real problem and derailer for them so i won't pick out loads but the diligent perfectionist i think i'll leave you with and just say you know it's really really important for you to be a diligent surgeon if you become perfectionist and fixated and can't leave something then is that helping everybody um, and again, enthusiasm. Everyone wants an enthusiastic surgeon, but do we want to be working with a volatile one? Discuss. Um, Self-awareness of surgeons. Again, won't go through all these references. Um, Megan Joffe, who I think talks other days like this, uh, did a brilliant job in assembling them. Short answer is surgeons aren't always as self-aware as they might perceive themselves to be. So just be aware of your lack of self-awareness. Um, and then I love this model as well, which is a um, an article called Rock Stars in Academic Medicine. I'll let you read the quote. I'm sure none of you would recognise any of those sort of personalities within any of the institutions that you have ever worked in. Um, again, it's, it's just really a reflection on... We all want brilliant personalities. We want real superstar people to work with. We want to be inspired and motivated. And, um, you know, you want to be close to those superstars. You want to be those superstars. But actually, um, just think about the person you are becoming as you go through that process and how you behave as you do. A uh, pet hate of mine is the really straightforward um, and oversimplified translation of one industry to another. So we say, why don't we learn from? Aviation. So, you know, if we just did everything like the airline industry, then we'd never have a problem. 
um, on character touring. Obviously, there is a huge, huge, huge amount to learn from aviation, and I think it's uh, there's some, been some brilliant, brilliant work that's been done. I would just make a case in all these examples I'm just going to go through to say take the best bits of another industry and translate them to your environment. Don't just blindly apply one thing from one industry to another. Be selective. Um, be open-minded so that you can understand that you know healthcare isn't unique and there's so much you can learn from other institutions. But don't, just don't assume one model will solve all your problems. Life's much more complicated than that. I'm a big cricket fan, so um, there's a big narrative about um, the England cricket side uh, becoming brilliant and they created a plan and they followed the plan and they won everything and it was fantastic. About two years later, it all fell apart. Um, so again, plans are really important. Having set processes are really important, but recognising that life gets in the way and human beings are complicated um, and not being fixated about just one model for um, solving all of this is another thing that I would highlight. And... Um, it's not as much the case now, but four or five years ago, you couldn't go to any event without someone telling you that marginal gains was the single solution to everything. And we'd all just be amazing if we followed those. And again, a huge amount of value and benefit in those type of models. Um, but also cycling has got a bit more complicated since then. And, um, you know, it perhaps wasn't everything that it was described as. So I guess the point I'm just making is, is think through how you can make sure throughout your career you're as open-minded to different approaches as you can be but never see anything as a magic bullet um if there is a magic bullet i think it's just how you behave um, and what can you do to avoid problems just finishing off now a big list of points here so i won't go through all of them but um regular discussions about the quality of performance i've already said uh, making sure you act on concerns at an early stage. Um, I would obviously say that it's really important to get the value and benefit of an independent external perspective um, at a very, very early point. Very rarely, I mean, quite often upset most people during an invited review we don't want to. We just want to be as helpful as we possibly, possibly can be. But if you're asking questions to people about complicated situations, then quite often and holding a mirror up to some of those situations quite often, it's going to be a difficult process and we recognize that and we you know we really take our role seriously in that um but what i would say is i've never had anyone come to us and say um i wish we had come to you much later in the process they always say i wish we'd come to you much sooner in the process um so it doesn't have to be us i'm not in any way um saying that just only our service is the one to use. There are loads and loads of different ways of getting an independent external perspective, um, but just do it within a structured process. Don't just ask your mate to come and help because that never goes well. Um, and um, yeah, just, just think through the benefit of getting that external view. Um, what I'm going to pick out here, but just make sure surgical services have clearly identified leaders that want to do the job and they're not just fitting it around everything else. Give them time and resources and back them to make a success of it. It's so important. Um, talk about behaviour. Review it regularly with it, with your colleagues. Um, you know, just ask people, how am I coming across? How, how, how are we working together at the moment? Uh, are things working well? Um, have those conversations, get that feedback early so that you don't find out two years down the line that everyone's been making notes about all the different um, explosions that you had in the coffee room or wherever. Um, and uh, yeah, then, then it all comes back to bite you. Um, people often forget to think about immediate impact on patient care when they're going through organisational change. So they're all fixated on the wonderful new facility that will be um, you know, used to uh, deliver the integrated pathway in three or four years time. And they forget about the here and now and the patient that's on the ward. Just never forget that patient and the you know, standard that you um, walk by as the standard you accept. Uh, consent have talked about new techniques and technologies, the quickest way to derail a career catastrophically and harm people is to introduce a new technique or technology in a really badly thought through way um, without having a proper process around it and without following organisational governance structures. Um, yeah, it doesn't happen an enormous amount of times, but when it does, nobody comes out of it well. So just think about that one. I'd say it's brilliant to be pushing the edge of surgical practice. It's brilliant to be the next person that comes up with a pioneering technique, but just make sure you do it within an appropriate organisational framework and don't be a lone ranger. Um, m and talks about audit programmes, appraisal, don't underestimate it. Um, 
trainees i think just just if you run a department that trainees want to come and work in that's a massive way of understanding whether your department's working well if your trainees don't want to come back to work with you um then there might be something in that obviously overplayed the other way and and you're kind of running some sort of uh place where there's a bit of command and control going on that's not healthy either but um yeah if you you talk to trainees um you can get a really interesting insight about which units people want to get consultant posts in um and what else oh just the classic sir bruce professor sir bruce keo if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know standard you're doing it too then you shouldn't be doing it um and i don't think there's ever really been true words i think just make sure you've got data um on your activity on your outcomes make sure it exists don't wait until the point where you're all falling out and you're all saying that x or y is behaving badly to realize you actually also don't have any data to show whether anyone's safe because if you end up at your clinical director or your medical director's door and you're all um got all kinds of infighting going on and you don't have one single agreed data set to show that you're safe then you've not only got problems with behaviours and team working interactions, you've also not got anything to provide assurance that it's not impacting on patient care, and that's a horrible place to be as a service. Um, so ignore that type of day-to-day data set at your peril. I think it's really important to have it. So I think that was my final slide, he says, hoping. Yep, um, and um, I'll just go back to saying, yeah, I, I think you all have amazing jobs that I envy uh, enormously um, and I wish you every success in them um, but I just think yeah, if, if you can use some of this learning to reflect on your own practice and uh, put some of that into um, practice in, in your day-to-day -day work then hopefully uh, you'll stay on straight and narrow and uh, not get into any sort of difficulties. Thank you. Thank you very much Ralph, uh, for an insight into the invited review mechanism, how does it work? And uh, also the sharing with us the, some of the common problems that get uh, people into trouble uh, and also how to avoid getting into trouble, which is very important to learn from these uh, events in the past. Does anybody have any question for, or comments to Ralph? It's Simon here. Yes. Just... Ralph, every sentence is a gem and every sentence you could expand onto a full talk. So you pack so much in there. Um, I like I like the way you try and make it optimistic that it's not as bad as we think it is. Um, on the other hand, just in our specialty, I think, you know, there's, there's too many examples of teams not functioning well um, to share your optimism fully. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do have the optimism, I do have the optimism that the more we talk about what good looks like, um, it'll gradually happen uh, and we will gradually make a difference. Um, but um, it's just so sad to see uh, colleagues suffering and patients suffering. And one final thing I'd like to say to everyone who's, who's listening is don't assume that the trust is uh, fully on board with the um, with the um, cure and the IRM process. Um, sadly, there are even bad institutions with bad cultures at the top. Um, and, and that's a further hurdle for the surgeons and the, the team in the surgical team to overcome. So um, it, it, it's a tough, tough agenda and we've got to work together and support each other to, um, to, to get through this. So thank you. Absolute pleasure. And I mean, yeah, I recognize the, the, the challenge to the, to the optimism. I, I, I guess I would say, that the fact you're having these conversations is an important start in that process and um you know i don't get invited to many associations to talk about these type of things in the way i get invited to yours so you know i think there's a lot of it out there in surgery i think that's a feature of of surgeons a bit although i think we should challenge that stereotype um but i think actually talking about it and trying to start getting the systems and processes in place to make things better is is the only way forward really thank you very much Ralph. Uh, very very wise words um just before i conclude um i'd like to ask my uh, co course directors if they have any comments uh Nareen. you're muted Nareen. um sham's actually got a comment so i'll just let oh, him go sorry. Okay. I, will get, I will get to him. Yeah, Ralph, fantastic presentation. Good to see you from the Royal College. And I, of course, understand Simon. 
Did you hear about the Crouton Gate? I think this is a, this is a lovely story from Southampton. Okay. This was a neurosurgeon nobody liked, and they wanted to trouble him and not his colleagues, but they all joined forces. This man was very good pediatric neurosurgeon, but most disliked, and they couldn't get him. So one day he bought a soup, and then he took a crouton and didn't pay for crouton. So they instigated that person to charge him for a fraud and suspended him on a crouton gate. And while happening, around 20 children didn't get the neurosurgery in the location they should have because he was the only one. So it's called crouton gate. It's not just us as the doctor, we stab each other, but this management can also watch you. As you said, you cannot come as a winner <laughs> when you take on the senior management. They can get you on the crouton gate. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, don't, I think the thing to me is it where things become sad is where they become about policies, procedures and processes, which are obviously really important, uh, but rather than people and patients. And um, I think that I don't, there's no simple or easy solution. I think we have to accept that if you are working with extraordinary people, all of you are doing extraordinary things on a daily basis today basis you, know, you can't expect all to be automaton robots personalities where you're not going to have ups and downs um, but it's about being human in our interactions with that um, making sure we understand where the line is in terms of right and wrong acceptable and not acceptable that we're able to challenge that and that actually people keep focus on what's important in that um, and and yeah I guess continue to challenge people to to get better and, and keep the right focus on the right things. Thank you. Uh, so I'll go back to you, Narayan, again. If you thank, thank you. I, I think it's been really insightful hearing the talks from Marion and uh, Ralph because they've sort of brought back, uh, brought us back to where we started in terms of why mentoring is important and why, as a society, we're uh, very much supporting this concept because they've highlighted some of the issues and problems that we can get into, but stress the importance of why mentoring can take doctors away from that. And if we educate people in the proper way of working in teams and developing a proper culture about putting the patient at the center of all of that. I think it is really powerful. And I think um, listening to the different uh, topics that have been brought up today is really important for some of the delegates to take away and how the society is really um, putting this high on the agenda to the importance of how we could su support the specialty of cardiothoracic surgery. So just to say thank you for both to you and Sham for bringing it up as a concept that we as a society needed to de develop and support. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sri. A big thank you, Mahmood and Sham, for bringing this program together and all the speakers today. It's been quite a riveting afternoon and it could happen to any one of us and going through the motions of how to support a trainee through the institutional review mechanism it was a fantastic afternoon. What we will try to do is to break them into small bites of individual talks and put them on the website. We will have to get a voiceover for our first speaker because we didn't record that session. But I think it will be a valuable resource for all those consultants who are doing clinics and operations who missed it out. And we will try to tidy it up and get it all on our website. We would urge all the delegates to kindly fill the feedback form which Letty will send you because it is on the strength of the feedback which we can make the next programs. And thank you again. Thanks very much, uh, Sri. Um, I do like to thank Sri and uh, Nareen for their support for this course from the beginning uh, and SITS Education and Letty for all the organization of uh, that she and all the efforts that she's put in in getting this course um, to fruition. Um, and I'm grateful for their support. Uh, as uh, Sri said, we would like to hear back from you about your feedback about the course, what you find useful, what else we could include in this kind of course, because our intention is to hopefully continue running this course um, probably twice a year, as I said, to try and get as many of the specialty involved in mentoring and hopefully working with the leadership in the SCTS to develop the scheme that will be suitable for our specialty um, to take it forward. I would like to thank all the speakers, 
uh, and for their fantastic talks and for all the contributors for uh, contributing through the, throughout the course. Uh, Sham, I'll give you the last word uh, before we uh, sign off. I think, thank you, Mahmoud. I think when we joined together as a trustee, this was the thing in our head because anyone of could be, you need two, three cases run an issue and you could be in trouble. So we all should be working cohesive. We're lucky we have a good team in SCCTS. Simon and his team has been done an excellent job, especially Marion and Ralph. You've given us such an insight that we didn't know where to look for. And there are already systems there. I think between Mahmoud, me and you, and probably Ralph, we should join, have sometimes just have a little brainstorm and come up with some sort of a solution which can put forward to Simon to add up for all our colleagues. Thank you, everyone, and people who had a time and energy on a Friday rather than going to the nightclub to stay and listen to us or a pub. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Thank you and goodbye. Have a good weekend bye -bye. and stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.